commencement exercises of the University of Washington will be opened with the presentation of the colors by the joint ROTC color guard and the singing of the Star Spangled Banner by Natalie Wickham. Ms. Wickham is graduating today with a Bachelor of Music degree in vocal performance and a Bachelor of Arts degree in early childhood and family studies. The audience will please rise. It is my pleasure to present the Chairman of the Board of Regents of the University of Washington, Herb Simon. I'm honored to be here to help celebrate the accomplishments of the Class of 2011. My fellow Regents and I are extremely proud of the graduates and how hard they have worked to reach the pivotal milestone in their lives. Congratulations. At this time, we want to take a moment to recognize and to express our deep appreciation to someone who has also put in a great deal of hard work and a total commitment. That is our university president, Phyllis Wise. On behalf of the Board of Regents and the University of Washington community, we want to thank Phyllis Wise for the exceptional job she has done in leading the university this past year. Taking on a university presidency is a challenge at any time. Taking on a presidency during the worst financial crisis our state has seen in more than half a century is a challenge of staggering proportions. But President Wise has not only coped with the pressure, she has excelled. She has led with purpose and passion and her tireless dedication to preserving the excellence that is the hallmark of our university will be appreciated for years to come. Now it is my pleasure to introduce the interim president of the University of Washington, Phyllis Wise. Welcome to the 136th ceremony of the University of Washington. Commencement ceremonies are an expression of academic traditions that go back hundreds of years, and they symbolize the most fundamental values of our civilization, most particularly the pursuit of truth, the preservation of freedom, and the cultivation of a climate of civility. 
These ceremonies are also festive, celebrating the commencement of new activities, challenges in the lives of the graduates, as well as the successful conclusion of one phase of your formal education. I am, I am honored, therefore, to formally congratulate the degree and award recipients and welcome all of you to this ceremony. <laughs> Graduates, you should be really proud of yourselves, and I know that all of the rest of us are proud of you as well. It is appropriate, therefore, that we all stand up, everyone, including the graduates, and applaud the class of 2011. Please be seated. The splendid music that you've been listening to during the processional and which you've been hearing more about later has been provided to us this afternoon by the students from the School of Music's Wind Ensemble under the direction of Professor Steve Morrison. As you can tell, they are gifted and dedicated and we greatly appreciate your participation today. The ultimate responsibility for the university lies in the members of the Board of Regents, 10 citizens of the state who were appointed by the governor and confirmed by the state senate. These dedicated men and women devote many hours each year to the welfare of the university. Six of our regents are with us this afternoon, and I would like to introduce them at this time, and I hope you will hold your applause until we go through the whole list. Herb Simon, Chair of the Board of Regents. Stanley H. Baer. William H. Gates. Joanne Harrell. Sally Jewell. And Francis Yoon, who is a regent and a student. Please help me to recognize the Board of Regents. Thank you. In addition to the regents, we have seated on the platform this afternoon the chief academic and administrative officers of the university, the vice presidents, vice provosts, deans of the schools and colleges, who will be introduced during the course of these ceremonies. We also have faculty members, professor emeriti, and elected student leadership, who you'll also meet in a little bit and other representatives of the various schools and colleges and departments of our university. In addition, we have J.W. Harrington, the chair of the Faculty Senate, Colleen Fukui Sketchley, the president of the Alumni Association, which has been keeping track of over 400,000 members of the Husky alumni family, connecting each one of them with each other and with the university. I would like to recognize the many members of the faculty serving today as commencement marshals. The names of these people are listed on page seven of your commencement program. And now I'd like to say just a few words to the graduates because I know that you're not here to listen to me but to get your degrees. But let me just say that it has been an incredible honor to be able to serve as the president during this interim year. In so doing, I've had amazing opportunities to meet with some of you, to meet with also people who are so passionate about the university in our ex as our external stakeholders. Just a month ago, I was in Asia and reminded even more that we educate people from around the globe who serve us in the state of Washington and many of whom go back home to become leaders in their own countries. They are such proud Huskies, accomplished, dedicated and world-changing leaders. So you will join these alums and we will expect the same of you. You are going out into a world that becomes more complex every day. 
and meeting the challenges of this world now requires even more creativity, collaboration, and tenacity than ever before. It requires a diversity of ideas and a commitment to lifelong learning. We hope that your experience here at the University of Washington has prepared you to go out there and to make us proud because it reflects back on the university for generations to come. During your time here, you've met wonderful people, remarkable teachers, and unbelievable fellow students who have made lasting impressions on your lives. And together, you have formed a truly extraordinary community. You have thrived here. You've distinguished yourselves in many wonderful ways. And I'm confident that you will continue to do great things as you go forward. So, now comes the presentation of the senior gift. I'd like to ask Rainier Achikosu and Kyle Fuller to present the class gift. Rainier is graduating today with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing and a Bachelor of Science in Public Health. Kyle is receiving a Bachelor of Arts in English, Creative Writing. Rainier and Kyle co-chaired the Senior Gift Council thanks to whose leadership the senior class has made this wonderful early start in philanthropy. Here's Kyle. I hate these things. Good afternoon, Huskies. Rainier and I worked with a fantastic volunteer team of 30 fellow seniors to organize the Senior Gift Campaign. It was important to choose a gift that both represented the values of our class and would enhance the university for future generations. Access to education is one of the defining issues of our generation, and we believe students of all economic backgrounds should have the opportunity to attend the UW. Therefore, we decided to create an endowment for Husky Promise as our class gift helping to ensure that qualified Washington residents will have the same or even better opportunities than we did. <laughs> On the Seattle campus alone, we've raised $49,678 in gifts and pledges. Can I get an amen to that, please? Woo! Seniors were also able to donate to different colleges, programs, or schools that have inspired them throughout the years. And now, President Weiss, we will present you with the names of all the donors. On behalf of the University of Washington, I thank you, the class of 2011, for your very generous gift. This will ensure that students in the future, in perpetuity, will be able to benefit from the kind of education that you have just received. The Chief Academic and Chief Budgetary Officer of the University is the Provost. This year's University Award winners will be presented by our Interim Provost, who is also a professor in the Departments of Microbiology and Chemical Engineering, Mary Lidstrom. Each year, the university presents awards to honor outstanding teachers, mentors, program staff, and alumni. Many of this year's award winners are with us today on the stage you may read about these amazing people on pages eight and nine of your program. I'd like to draw particular attention to those who have won awards for teaching and mentoring students. Five University of Washington professors have been selected to receive the Distinguished Teaching Award this year. They are William Talbot, Professor of Philosophy, Valerie Curtis Newton, Associate Professor in Acting and Directing, Jonathan Mercer, Associate Professor of Political Science, Christina Fung, Assistant Professor of Management and Organization, and Stuart Regis, 
principal lecturer in computer science and engineering. We'll uh, acknowledge all of them at, at the end, so please hold your applause. There are three professors that are winners of specialized teaching awards. The recipient of the Marsha L. Landolt Distinguished Graduate Mentor Award is David Takuchi, Professor of Sociology and Associate Dean for Research in the School of Social Work. The recipient of the S. Sterling Monroe Public Service Teaching Award is Morva McDonald, Associate Professor in Curriculum and Instruction. The recipient of the James D. Klaus Award for the Advancement of Learning Communities is David Prince, Science and Information Technology Coordinator, Student Academic Services College of Engineering. Two graduate students with teaching responsibilities have won Excellence in Teaching Awards. They are Natasha Jones, Teaching Assistant in Human Centered Design and Engineering, and Andrew Cockrell, Teaching Assistant in Political Science. Four other award recipients also deserve special mention. Tracy Hirachi, Associate Professor in the School of Social Work, is the winner of the Outstanding Public Service Award. Art Professor Lane Goldsmith is the recipient of the Distinguished Contributions to Lifelong Learning Award. The Distinguished Librarian Award recipient is Nancy Hewling, Head of Reference and Research Services. And Patricia Bostrom is the winner of the 2011 Alumni Association Distinguished Service Award. Finally, five of our Distinguished Staff Award winners are here with us today. They are Tanya Eng Aquino, Troy Swanson, Lori Mitchell, Paul Ishizuka, and Charles Brown. I would like all of our award winners today to stand and be acknowledged both for their extraordinary achievements and for their many contributions to the university. Since 1932, the university, in recognition of extraordinary academic achievement, has presented a medal to the graduating senior with the most distinguished academic record at the university. One medal is awarded to the student who has completed at least three quarters of his or her degree requirements at the university. And one is awarded to a student who has entered with at least 60 transfer credits from a Washington community college. The first recipient of this year's President's Medal Award is Jacob Tyler Bobman. Jake, would you please come forward? Jake is graduating with degrees in mathematics and biochemistry with minors in chemistry, music, and international studies. Decided to be multifaceted in one, interdisciplinary in one person. He has engaged in research projects on topics ranging from behavioral neuroscience to cryptography. He's also studied abroad in Costa Rica and is a member of the Men's Glee Club and a chemistry tutor and has been extremely active in the honors program. A longtime volunteer at the Klein Galland Nursing Home, Jake also has volunteered at the UW Medical Center and at an alternative high school through the Pipeline Project. Jake never sleeps. <laughs> Jack's, Jake's academic achievements include being a Washington State Scholar, a member of Phi Beta Kappa, Alpha Epsilon Delta, Phi Lambda Upsilon, and Sigma Alpha Lambda National Leadership and Honors Organization. He has received UW Honors, the UW Honors Program Undergraduate Scholar Award and the Robert C. Byrd Honors Scholarship and a National Merit Scholarship. Jake will enter the medical school class of uh, 2000 and, uh, I guess 15 at Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons, where he will start this fall. Jake, it is my very great pleasure to present you this medal in recognition of your outstanding achievements at the university. The 
recipient of the President's Medal for the student who entered the university from a Washington community college is Quinn Hong Yuen. Will Quinn please come forward? Quinn transferred to the University of Washington from Seattle Central Community College. A biochemistry major, Quinn has taken advantage of opportunities to conduct undergraduate research and has explored her special interest in Alzheimer's disease. While at the UW, Quinn has been an active member of the Pre-Pharmacy Club and she has also volunteered at the UW Medical Center, helping with inpatient pharmacy. Outside of school, Quinn has participated in the Tien Il Choir of the Vietnamese Catholic Church in Seattle. Her academic honors include Association for Women in Science Scholarship, a Berkelhammer Book Award from the Department of Chemistry, and the UW Pre-Pharmacy Club Scholarship. This fall, Quinn will begin her work on a PharmD degree at the University of Illinois at Chicago as she moves closer to her career goals of becoming a pharmacist. I am very pleased to present to you, Quinn, this medal in recognition of your outstanding achievements at the university. At this time, I would also like to recognize those students who are today graduating with the university's highest baccalaureate honors, summa cum laude, magna cum laude, and cum laude. Their names are listed in your programs on page 15. Since 1938, the university and the Alumni Association have presented an award to a former University of Washington student whose work has attained national and international prominence. The Alumna Summa Laude Dignata Award, which means alumna worthy of the highest praise, is the highest honor bestowed by the university upon one of its graduates. Today, we add to that long list of distinguished individuals who have received this award the name of Jane Lubchenco. She is the administrator of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Would Dr. Lubchenco please join me at the lectern? <laughs> Dr. Lubchenco earned her Master of Science degree in zoology at the University of Washington in 1971. After receiving her PhD at Harvard, she taught there for two years before moving back to the Pacific Northwest and taking a faculty position at Oregon State University, eventually becoming the chair of the Department of Zoology. As a researcher, her expertise includes ocean communities, climate change, and interactions between the environment and human beings. She has worked tirelessly to bridge the gap between the scientific research community and the public understanding and has co-founded three organizations that facilitate communication between the scientific community and the public, policymakers, the media, and industry. In 2009, she became the ninth and the first woman administrator of NOAA. A little more than a year after taking the reins at NOAA, Dr. Lubchenco faced the largest single marine spill in United States history after the Deep Horizon oil rig exploded in the Gulf of Mexico. Nature Magazine later recognized her as its Newsmaker of the Year, referring to her leadership during crisis. Amidst all of her national and international activity, Dr. Lubchenco continues to be accessible to UW graduates and has provided invaluable assistance in aligning many of our students with international research activities. One of the most highly cited ecologists in the world, Dr. Lubchenco has earned numerous awards and distinctions, including the Heinz Award for the Environment, the MacArthur Genius Award, 12 honorary degrees, and election to the National Academy of Sciences and the Royal Society. It is my distinct honor to bestow upon you the, the um, award of Alumna Summa Lauda Dignate for 2011. Thank you. 
I'd now like to introduce the presidents of the ASUW and the GPSS. Student government, that is shared governance between the administration, faculty, and students is absolutely a key to the success of the University of Washington. Student government is an important component of the governance of this institution, and its leadership is called on regularly to represent the students, you the students, your views on a wide variety of issues at the university. I am pleased to introduce to you now the president of the ASUW, Madeline McKenna, and the president of the GPSS, Sarah Reinevelt. Good afternoon, class of 2011. As we wait to cross the stage today, I'm sure many of us and many of our loved ones are thinking about how much we've changed and grown during our time here at the University of Washington. We're more confident, more independent, and hopefully a little smarter. College was a time of many firsts for us. Many of us moved out on our own for the first time, traveled abroad for the first time, fell in love for the first time, maybe did our laundry for the first time, uh, maybe stumbled home from Earls on the Ave for the first time. Yes, you know who you are. And while we've changed, the world around us has changed too. Four years ago, in the fall of 2007, when most of the class of 2011 entered college, hardly anyone here owned an iPhone. No one had ever heard of toxic assets. The Tea Party was only an event that happened in 1773. Our football team hadn't had a winning season in five years. Uh, Osama bin Laden was still roaming around somewhere. Justin Bieber had yet to be born. And the only black president that Americans knew was on 24. Yes, the world has changed significantly since 2007, and so have we, the graduates. Looking to the years ahead, two things are certain. We'll continue to grow as individuals, and the world around us will continue to change. Yet I'm here today to tell you that while change is inevitable, progress is not. Progress depends on our actions and how we choose to live out the values that our families and that our community here at the UW instilled in us. It will take the entrepreneurial spirit of an innovative generation to overcome our global hardships. And that innovative generation will be us. The architects in this audience will design sky skyscrapers. Our engineers will build bridges. Our artists will compose masterpieces. And our philosophers will uncover new knowledge. Together, we will build the legacy of our generation. And when I look out into this crowd and see you all decked out in your graduation robes, I can't help but be filled with hope for our future. Usually when you're wearing a robe at 3 in the afternoon, it means you've given up on your future or that you attend Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. But today, our robes represent all that we've accomplished in the last four years and to signify the next great journey that we're about to embark upon. Congratulations to the class of 2011. It's been an honor to serve as your ASUW president. Thank you to all the friends, families, teachers, mentors who helped us get to this moment. And now on to the next big adventure. Thank you. Congratulations class of 2011. As the president of the Graduate and Professional Student Senate, I'm here to congratulate all the graduate students, the MAs, the MPAs, the PhDs, the MDs, the ADs, all that are here receiving their degrees on this momentous day. It feels pretty amazing to be graduating again, doesn't it? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> While you sit here today as graduates of this great institution, Think back to your first day on this beautiful University of Washington campus. It is likely that your decision to return to school to obtain your graduate degree wasn't easy or seamless. As members of Generation Y, you probably agonized over your decision. You worried about foregone salaries, sacrifices by those you love, and that need to find your individual higher calling. Today, my friends, We've been transformed to what we set out here to become, 
and we have been forever changed by the friends we've made here, the professors that have challenged and pushed us, and the unsurpassed quality of education that we've received at this world-class institution. Surrounded by your friends, your families, your colleagues, you're ready to take that next step. As you sit here today, I'd ask you to remember what brought you here. Think about something more than the promise of a bigger paycheck, something that cannot be measured on a balance sheet, the desire to make a difference, to leave your mark on your chosen profession. For me, the desire to be an environmental attorney was sparked when I heard the story of Lois Gibbs, a 1920s housewife in Love Canal, whose activism in response to the environmental disaster caught the attention of a national media and forced the company responsible for the disaster to clean up, winning justice for the community. For you out there, it may have been the desire to serve underserved communities, to invent cures for diseases, to create entrepreneurial solutions to global problems. The list, my friends, goes on and on. We are here today to recognize our individual successes, but our successes as a world will be vitally linked to what we can do as leaders for our communities. As we take the next step that will define our professional lives, my fellow UW graduates, think about that passion, that thing that led you here, and use the skills that you have learned here to make a difference in your community. Remember the words of Gandhi and be the change that you want to see in the world and your community. If not you, my fellow UW graduates, who? Congratulations, class of 2011. Go dogs! We are deeply honored today to have as our commencement speaker Kathleen Sebelius, the United States Secretary of Health and Human Services. Secretary Sebelius leads the principal agency charged with monitoring the health of the American public, ensuring that individuals get health care that they need, and providing children, families, and seniors with essential human services. She also oversees one of the largest civilian departments in the federal government with nearly 80,000 employees. As the country's highest ranking health official, she is guiding the implementation of the historic Affordable Care Act. She has been at the forefront of efforts to build a 21st century health care system from expanding the primary care workforce and putting a new focus on prevention and wellness to promoting electronic medical records. She has also been a leader during the public health crises, coordinating the government's response to, to the 2009 H1N1 virus and helping to provide rapid medical assistance to the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico and the devastating earthquake in Haiti. Prior to her current appointment, Secretary Sebelius served for six years as the governor of Kansas. She holds a Master of Public Administration degree from the University of Kansas and a Bachelor of Arts degree from Trinity Washington University. Please join me in welcoming the United States Secretary of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius. Well, thank you very much. President Wise, members of the Board of Trustees, faculty members, and to the almost 11,000 graduates of the class of 2011, it's a real honor to be with you today in beautiful, partly sunny Seattle. I've decided that the other Washington is a much friendlier atmosphere than the real Washington, so I may spend more of my time out here. I want to give a shout out to your distinguished alum, Jane Lubchenco, the administrator of NOAA, who is a great cabinet colleague and has provided incredible leadership for our entire country. 
But before I begin, I really want to start with acknowledging the friends and families and supporters who are here today. You know, I have a wise friend who reminds me regularly that we all drink from wells we didn't dig and are warm by fires we didn't build. So graduates, you wouldn't be here today without the sacrifice, the support, and encouragement of your loved ones who are here. So before I go any further, please get on your feet, graduates, and give them all a round of applause. Give them a shout out. They deserve it. They were with you every step along the way. And as you sit back down, I hope you'll remember that being a Husky is a state of mind and not your body size for the future. So when I was thinking about what I wanted to say today, I thought back on my own college days and to some words that have stayed with me all these years. They're from a speech that Bobby Kennedy gave 45 years ago this week to students in South Africa. Now to set the stage a little bit, the year was 1966, the year I went to college. The civil rights movement was in full fervor. Congress had outlawed Jim Crow laws two years earlier, but in cities and towns across America, the fight for equal rights was still a day-to-day -day struggle. And in South Africa, apartheid still reigned. Black South Africans attended separate schools, rode separate buses, used separate restrooms, and were being systematically forced out of their neighborhoods and their towns in a national campaign to make sure that blacks and whites were separate. At that time, few foreign leaders would even meet with black South Africans. But when Kennedy was invited to give a speech to a group of students, black and white, at the University of Cape Town, he decided to go. And in his remarks, he argued that overcoming prejudice and discrimination was the defining challenge for both countries. And when it came to a way forward, here's what he said. He said, our answer is the world's hope. It's to rely on youth. The cruelties and obstacles of this swiftly changing planet will not yield to obsolete dogmas and outworn slogans. This world demands the qualities of youth not a time of life, but a state of mind, a temper of will, a quality of imagination, a predominance of courage over timidity, of the appetite of adventure over a love of ease. Now think about that for a minute. In the struggle of the greatest challenge of his age, Kennedy didn't appeal to governmental officials. In fact, South Africa's leadership refused to meet with him on his trip. He didn't appeal to corporate leaders or to wealthy philanthropists. He didn't appeal to academics or famous entertainers. He appealed to the young people of the country, to the students. Now, often folks my age come to graduations and say, here are the lessons I've learned, follow this advice and you'll be successful. But what Kennedy knew and what I wanna to stress today is that wisdom isn't the only thing that builds with age. Growing older can also bring complacency and cautiousness. It can produce timidity and a lack of moral courage. Now, I'm not saying that experience has no value and you all still do need to call your mothers and listen to what she says. But it's no accident then when you look back on the most transformational moments in America's history, you see young people leading the way. Thomas Jefferson was just 32 when he wrote the words that became our nation's North Star. Martin Luther King was 26 when he led the Montgomery bus boycott. And Seattle's own Bill Gates was just 20 when he dropped out of college to start a company that brought power into America's homes and offices with something called a personal computer. 
Now, Gates is a good example. He was a college sophomore when he read in a magazine that a company needed software for a new type of machine, a personal computer. And Gates called up the company and volunteered to sell it to them. There was just one problem. He hadn't written the software yet. But luckily, they gave him a month. And Gates had what Kennedy called the qualities of youth. He had the vision to imagine a totally different world than the one he lived in, a world where computers weren't huge devices used only by highly trained experts, but valuable tools that could unlock information for average Americans. And more importantly, he took a big risk. He had enough confidence in his own idea that he pitched a product that didn't even exist yet but he believed he could make it. Now, without risk, there's no transformative change. As you grow older, it's often harder to take that chance. With every new milestone in your life, there'll be more excuses to play it safe. And even now, some of you may feel you've invested so much time and money to get your degree that you're committed to a certain path. And I urge you to disregard those thoughts. When I graduated from college 100 years ago, I had never been to Kansas. A few decades later, I was governor of that state. So the best laid plans are often interrupted by opportunities you never dreamed of. Be open to new possibilities. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Because you're setting out into a world that I believe demands the qualities of youth, that demands you to see the world as it could be, not as it is, and the courage to believe you're the ones to change it, and then go do it. I see that work every day in my work in healthcare. Today in the United States, thanks to great universities like here at the University of Washington and others around the country, we have the best trained doctors and nurses and researchers in the world. We have the world's best equipment and devices and medicines. We spend far more on health care than any other country. But we continue to live sicker and die younger than many nations on Earth. And we've been struggling for decades to answer some basic questions. How do we provide affordable health care to every American? How can we slow the rising costs that are taking away from other investments like higher education? How do we reward doctors for the quality of their work and not the quantity of procedures they run? How do we keep people healthy rather than waiting to treat their illnesses? I know here at the University of Washington, there's cutting edge work going on on global health issues. And even as we continue to work on Americans' health challenges, sharing resources, knowledge, and curing diseases, and providing important capacity throughout the world, we'll need dedicated and continued focus. So how we respond to these questions will have a huge impact on our nation's future health and on our prosperity as a nation. And the answer, in many cases, isn't incremental changes but a fundamental shift in how we do things. Now, government can provide an initial push, and that's what our new health care law is doing. But the transformation of health care really relies on you. Now, I can hear some of you saying, I'm in my 20s, I don't own a hospital, I don't run an insurance company, I don't have a vote in Congress. What possible difference can I make? But all you have to do is look across the globe, look at the Middle East and Northern Africa, where young people with far fewer resources and advantages than you have are leading the fight to remake their countries. Leaders clinging to power in those nations are trying to shut down Twitter and Facebook. Now that's not to stop people my age from rising up, but to stop the power of young people who are willing to take huge risks for a bright future they can only imagine. Or look around like your classmates like Jeffrey Morgan. 
Jeffrey, who was studying abroad in China when the 2008 earthquake hit. University of Washington offered to bring him home. But he decided to stay, and he raised money for much-needed school supplies, and then organized a letter-writing campaign that delivered almost 6,000 letters to students affected by the earthquake. So they knew that people around the world were supporting them. So my advice to you is embrace the qualities of youth. Dream big and live boldly. It's not a new idea. It's captured in dozens of graduation cliches that swing for the fences or reach for the stars, no risk, no reward. But the reason those cliches stick around is because they do contain some real wisdom. Today, our country faces big challenges that won't yield themselves to incremental change or small ambition or a narrow vision of what's possible. It will be up to you, class of 2011, to help solve those challenges, not in 10 years or 20 years or once you've reached the end of some path, but starting today. So let me end by quoting from Mr. Spock from Star Trek, who used to say, live long and prosper. I think it's a pretty good motto for the healthcare system we envision for America one in which all of our citizens live long and prosperous lives. With your energy, your talent, your education, and most importantly, your qualities of youth, I'm confident we can not only make this vision a reality, but also rise together to meet the greatest challenges of our times. Congratulations, class of 2011. Good luck and Godspeed.